I believe that that is all for formal business. So <laughs> I'm not sure that's a very high bar. Um, I inform the Senate that at 8.30am today, 18 proposals were received in accordance with Standing Order 75. The question of which proposal would be submitted to the Senate was determined by lot. As a result, I inform the Senate that the letter from Senator Kitching proposing a matter of urgency was chosen. It is shown at item 13 on today's order of business. Is the proposal supported? I understand that informal arrangements have been made to allocate specific times to each speaker in today's debate. With the concurrence of the Senate, I shall ask the clerks to set the clock accordingly. And I call Senator Walsh. Uh, thank you very much, President. Well, uh, no one knows uh, better than a Victorian uh, that just wishing for the pandemic to be over uh, will not make it over. The reality is that we are now facing the prospect of another new variant on our shores. Uh, but at a time when we should be feeling confident about our ability to manage this new strain of the virus, Australians are again concerned. Um, concerned because even after two years of this pandemic, we still cannot trust this government to respond. We still cannot trust this government to deliver us through this new challenge that we're facing today because we know how this government responds in a crisis, uh, and it is always, always too little, too late. It's always someone else's responsibility. It's always a matter for the states. For the past two years, Prime Minister Morrison he has had just two jobs, two jobs that Australians needed him to do to keep us safe deliver a fast, speedy, effective vaccination program and deliver new, fit-for-purpose, national quarantine facilities. And we all know the story. We all know what happened. We all know the story of the failed vaccine rollout. Apparently, it wasn't a race, according to Mr Morrison. Apparently, no one in government needed to pick up the phone when Pfizer called. Uh, and almost two years on, we still have no dedicated, purpose-built national quarantine facilities, no new federal quarantine facilities. Uh, and throughout this year in particular, Australians have paid the price. 2022 was the year that Australians just did not need to go through. Lockdowns, restrictions, border closures. 2022 was the year of COVID that we just didn't need to have because the Prime Minister failed to roll out the vaccines. He said it wasn't a race. He didn't pick up the phone to Pfizer. He failed to roll out the vaccines. And that failure, of course, has been called by the former Prime Minister, Mr Turnbull, the biggest public policy failure on record the biggest public policy failure on record. And two years into this pandemic, we are still reliant on leaky and insufficient hotel quarantine. We know that hotels were built for tourists. They weren't built to deal with this crisis. And that's why we needed the government to build purpose-built quarantine facilities. Uh, and now we can add to all of this the absolute snail pace that this government is displaying uh, in establishing mRNA capacity here in Australia. Sovereign capacity that we urgently need, vaccines that we urgently need to produce right here in Australia. Now, the success of mRNA vaccines became apparent last year in the pandemic. And it became clear last year just how critical this technology would be uh, in our ongoing fight against the pandemic. ...manufacturing capacity in Australia. Uh, and this is an absolutely essential capability 
that we need to continue to protect Australians and our regional neighbours as well from this virus. But this government was so slow to even announce an mRNA bid. Uh, and since then, it has been absolutely glacial in rolling that process out. Um, first, they said we would be making the vaccines here uh, in 12 months. Then it became 24 months. Uh, now it's sometime in the next three years. We are still waiting for the Morrison government to announce the results of its approach to market, its belated, snail-paced approach to market to manufacture mRNA vaccines right here. Um, we still have no announcement over five months after expressions of interest uh, closed. Um, five months. Uh, and in that five months, uh, and in the period before the government even announced its bid, the rest of the world has already moved. Um, there is a global race on to attract these facilities. Uh, and this is yet another race that this government wants Australians to lose. Yet another race that this government wants Australians to lose. We know how critical this particular vaccine technology is to our ability to protect against this virus uh, and the current variant and any future variants. But we are still waiting, waiting, waiting for this government to get its plans off the drawing board. Australian scientists, businesses, manufacturers, they are all ready to go. Uh, just today, the first trial mRNA drug uh, made in Australia was produced in Victoria. Uh, it was made in a facility in Baronia in Melbourne. Uh, it's now heading to clinical trials. Uh, and this um, is great news. It should be great news. It would be even better news uh, if we had in Australia the mRNA manufacturing facility that we need to actually make this a reality. If we had the type of facility that could take innovations like that, Australian-made innovations, out of the trial phase and into advanced manufacturing. But we don't, and we don't know when that is going to happen because the Morrison government still has its plans on the drawing board. The Morrison government is holding us back from building the mRNA capacity that we urgently need. They are holding us back to the back of the line in a global race. This is the track record of our federal government. Always too little, too late, always. Australians need their government to get moving. Australians need their government to get in the race. But instead of leadership from this Prime Minister, what we have seen, particularly in the last few weeks, is just division. From the very early days of this crisis, we have seen the Prime Minister prioritise politics over the best interests of the people, blaming the state premiers instead of backing them when they were making the tough calls that needed to be made to keep us safe playing state off against state, turning his back on millions of people locked down in what he decided, the Prime Minister decided divisively, to label the Victorian wave of the pandemic. And now, when we most need unity, he is playing a dangerous game of doublespeak, condemning the violent threats of protesters on one hand, but then straight away saying that he has sympathy with their concerns on another. He is playing a dangerous game that undermines the advice of the health experts, a game that could impact the critical uptake of booster shots that we need to prevent another winter lockdown. He is playing a game which undermines the unity and the goodwill displayed by millions of Australians who have done the right thing and gone and got themselves vaccinated. We know that this is not a game, that there are lives at stake, that the sacrifices of millions of Australians should not be undermined in what is a desperate scrounge for votes from this Prime Minister. But this is a government that is desperate, desperate to avoid responsibility, desperate to, to avoid scrutiny, desperate to save itself, 
before anything else. So desperate to distract from their long list of failures that they are prepared to play footsie with extremists. We have a Prime Minister who refuses to unequivocally condemn the violent threats against state MPs and state premiers. He refuses to act as a leader and do the hard thing and tell the violent protesters that the crisis is not over, that there is more work to do. He refuses to tell them that while it's difficult, we can get through this if we actually stand together. A real leader would deliver the unity that we need to move forward together. Thank you. Uh, Sarah Betts. Today's matter of urgency is a huge window into Labor's policy void, policy vacuum and petty vindictiveness. So can I thank Labor for moving this motion? because it's a huge public service. Because on the one hand, all that we have seen in the motion and the first contribution is nothing short of relentless negativity. Now, if I were an opposition senator believing that my party was worthy of government, I'd be moving a matter of urgency saying that the government should be adopting my positive policy platform, but not a single word of alternative from the Australian Labor Party in the motion or in the debate uh, thus far. All we have is a fact devoid negativity being thrown at us. So let's move to that which is before us. First of all, the government is accused of its ongoing failure to open any new federal quarantine facilities. Well, at Howard Springs there's already a facility that I think caters for a thousand or so, but we are, as we speak, building facilities in Victoria. We expect construction of the first 250 beds will be completed by the end of 2021, within a month. And do you know, and this is the shallowness of the Labor Party attack on this. And do you know why it'll only be the end of this year? Because of the state Labor government's lockdown of its state delayed the completion. And the federal government pleaded with the state Labor government, saying, please give an exemption for the building of these quarantine facilities in Victoria so that they can be ready. And so typical Labor style, talking out of both sides of their mouths, on the one hand, the state Labor government says, no, we will not give you an exemption, and then federal Labor uses that denial of an exemption to condemn the federal government for not building the facility. That sort of shallowness tells you everything you need to know about the Australian Labor Party and why it is not fit for office. But in Western Australia, Mr uh, Acting Deputy President, your home state in Queensland, the federal government's working towards construction of the first 500 beds at various sites being completed by the first quarter of 2022. So here we are just on the cusp of about to deliver all these quarantine beds and facilities that Labor are asking about. And what do they do? Instead of celebrating the quick movement and that we are on the cusp of delivering, what are they doing? They're telling us, oh, they're not ready yet. Isn't this terrible? Just relentless negativity and no, and no description to us as a nation as to how they may have done or would have done things differently. And indeed, uh, in referring uh, to the uh, Victorian situation, Multiplex was the company, in fact, that was on track for delivery of the first 500 beds by December, which is next month. We're on the very last day of November today. And the Finance Minister wrote to the Victorian Premier seeking an exemption from lockdown for the Mickleham project. The Victorian government did not agree to any any concessions whatsoever, and undoubtedly that is part of the coordinated Labor Party political playbook that the state government will refuse and delay so that federal Labor can somehow take advantage of it. How shallow, how un-Australian, but sadly 
how very, very predictable uh, it is from Labor to engage in such stunts. But I have every confidence that the Australian people will see through it. But what are Labor doing? They are just crying crocodile tears. It is fake concern because they must, surely they must know the truth about the facilities just about to come online and the delays occasioned by state Labor. But no, no, they seek to airbrush all that out of the equation. But look, having dealt with the quarantine facilities, let me turn to the other aspect of the motion, uh, the delivering of sovereign Myrna vaccine manufacturing capacity. Look, uh, wouldn't we all love it? That would be great, wouldn't it? But can I say, uh, Mr uh, Acting Deputy President, that no country in the world there are no new, there are no new end-to-end Myrna facilities that have been established since the vaccines were approved anywhere, anywhere in the world. Oh, that was just a slight omission, I'm sure, by the Labor Party mover of this, uh, this urgency matter. Nowhere in the world does it exist. Yet somehow <coughs> they seek to slap the Federal Liberal National Party government around the chops for not having done that, which nobody else in the world has been able to achieve as yet. Yeah, please give us a break. Do not use this pandemic for such cheap political points when you know that what you are saying to the Australian people is demonstrably false on all the evidence. So I would encourage the next Labor speaker tell us where there is that capacity anywhere in the world. And if you can't, I would say to the Australian Labor Party, apologise for having, for having brought this matter forward. And then we have the assertion that we somehow haven't protected Australians and our neighbours. Well, again, let's look at the evidence. Let's look at the facts. Australia has pledged to supply up to 60 million doses to our region by the end of 2022, of which up to 15 million would go to the Pacific and Timor-Leste. We have shared over 2.3 million doses with our neighbours in the Pacific and Timor-Leste as of 17 November. Australia has provided 1.076 million AstraZeneca vaccine doses to Fiji. How many more would Labor have delivered? Not a word, not even a word as to how much has actually been done uh, in this space. Six, 677,000 uh, doses to Timor-Leste, 213,000 doses to the Solomon Islands, uh, 204,000 to PNG, 100,000 doses to Vanuatu. These are all figures as of the 17th of November, as well as medical supplies, personal protective equipment, and testing equipment. Australia has committed $623.2 million to assist vaccine procurement and rollout efforts in the Pacific and Southeast Asia. Excuse me, but where does Labor get this nonsense from that we have done nothing for our neighbourhood or nothing for our region? Demonstrably false on the figures. And I would encourage the next Labor speaker to say how they would have done more and how. But finally, let me deal with what is so vindictive and nasty, this talking about pandering to anti-vax extremists. I happen to be vaccinated. I encourage people to be vaccinated. But I'm willing to accept that men and women of good faith looking at the same evidence can come to different conclusions. And you know what? Even the very best of our judiciary in the High Court taking the same oath of office, hearing the same evidence, applying the same law, come to different conclusions. And that is why sometimes the High Court is split 4-3. Or those of us that did jury trials from time to time, men and women sworn into a jury, hear the same evidence, and you get a split jury verdict. 
Why? Because men and women of good faith applying themselves to the same situation can reasonably come to different conclusions. The same in the vaccination space. Respectfully, I disagree with them. But to call them anti-vax extremists is, if you like, Hillary Clinton-esque of the deplorables that cost her the election against Donald Trump. And so the Australian Labor Party deserves to lose the next election because what they are seeking to do is to divide the Australian society into a two-tier system of the vaccinated and the unvaccinated. And we on this side, whilst we have certain views about vaccination, we are willing to accept that there are alternate views. This motion shows that Labor is not ready you, to Senator govern. Uh, Senator Patrick. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I'd like to rise to talk on an aspect of the vaccine rollout that actually flows a little bit on from what Senator Betts has uh, talked about, uh, but in my view hasn't been discussed in enough detail and certainly without the extreme uh, rhetoric that can, uh, uh, can sometimes be attached to both sides of this argument. And that goes to where are the boundaries in relation to restrictions that are being imposed upon people who have not been vaccinated. Now, I just want to state my position really clearly. I am fully vaccinated and I intend to get a booster. I, uh, my view is that everyone who is medically able should get a vaccination. But I also accept there are some people, and I've spoken to constituents who say to me, uh, Rex, I'm really scared. I've got, I had uh, a woman I was chatting to the other day said, I've got, I'm a single mother. I'm very scared about what's, uh, what's going to happen. I'm not trying to be violent. I'm not trying to be extreme. I just, I'm worried. I'm genuinely worried about what happens if I, if I were to take uh, or to receive a vaccination. <clears throat> Again, my position is ma mass vaccination has and will save lives. I also think that uh, max va mass vaccination has played a key role uh, in Australia opening up uh, and uh, 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 you know, has helped uh, from a national and uh, a, a statewide health restrictions perspective. But again, there are some questions that need to be properly asked. Restrictions and exemptions, and I point out that w there, there ought to be exemptions. There are good cases for exemptions. I don't think have necessarily been well spelt out to people. Uh, both, uh, and I'm talking about exemptions, uh, re restrictions and exemptions at both a federal, state and local government level. We do have inconsistency around the state and the territories. Uh, right across our federation. I don't think that is helpful. Sometimes trying to untangle what the restrictions are and indeed where the exemptions may lie can be very difficult. Where does the legal basis for restrictions lie and where are the, what are the, what are the um, limits of those uh, legal restrictions? Those are things we ought to be talking about. They're things that we, we ought to understand. And I'll give you another example of this. We have business entities imposing restrictions on people who uh, have um, not been vaccinated. Now, I listened the other day to Senator Lambie's speech. It was one of the best speeches I think she's ever given. And I support all of the features of her speeches where she talks about never wanting uh, someone who's uh, unvaccinated to go into a, an aged care facility and, and uh, put at risk uh, the elderly. The same would be said about children. But there are some businesses who are uh, in good faith, as uh, Senator Betts uh, talked about, in good faith are imposing restrictions. What are the legal basis for them doing so? And what are the boundaries? What are the limits of those, of those restrictions? I was speaking with the BCA the other day. They're quite worried about what happens when they, they, as employers, say to their employees, you can't attend work and, in fact, you may not be uh, employed uh, if you do not get, get yourself vaccinated. Now, it's unclear to me the legal basis for uh, 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 such an indication to an employee, 
And I don't know what happens when someone who is a good worker, happy to do their work, uh, gets themselves into a situation where an employer says, I'm sorry, you have to go. What may happen in those circumstances, or what I suspect will happen in those circumstances, is we'll end up with a matter before the Fair Work Commission uh, where uh, uh, the facts will be presented, the circumstances and the law will be discussed and some decision will be made. But right now there is great uncertainty. Where are the boundaries? And I think that's something that government ought to pay some attention to, to assist the community to make it easier for the community to understand, to make the worker understand what their rights might be and to, to make sure that the employers understand what their rights may be. There are boundaries. There, there may be circumstances where it's quite inappropriate to, uh, to apply a restriction. I wonder about the intersection of uh, restrictions on COVID, uh, on people who have, have not been vaccinated entering into a medical facility. How does that intersect with the Hippocratic Oath? I don't know the answer to these questions, uh, but I think we ought to be thinking about them. And I think the government ought to put some effort into that space to help uh, uh, remove some of the confusion. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Patrick. We're going to go to Senator Pratt. Senator Pratt, you might be on mute still, Senator Pratt. Thank you. I just wasn't sure if you were giving the call to me. I am, and uh, we can hear you clearly now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Today I speak on the urgency motion in relation to what is very clearly a, the government's continuingly dangerous, lacklustre approach to this pandemic. We now have the new Omicron variant being found in Australia this week. It brings into harsh focus the fact that we have a too little, too late approach coming from this government. We've seen it for the last two years of this pandemic. We have said it time and time and time again that this, job, this government had two jobs in the pandemic, two jobs, to vaccinate the country and to have a national quarantine scheme around the country. Both of these are federal responsibilities. According to our constitution, it couldn't be clearer. They are the constitutional responsibilities of our federal government, and the Morrison government has failed at achieving or taking responsibility for both. Not only have they shirked their responsibilities, they have attacked state governments like Western Australia, Queensland and Victoria who have filled the void, filled the void to fight tooth and nail to patch up the gaps left by this federal government's shortfalls, where we have necessarily been left with COVID lockdowns and border closures because of the lack of quarantine uh, support from the Commonwealth and also because of the slow vaccination accessibility coming from overseas. We should have had a government that was prepared to back responsible lockdowns and border closures instead of causing division in the community. Division and divisiveness. You know, we saw uh, the, this government side with Clive Palmer trying to tear down the West Australian border control. And then we have a Prime Minister who then goes on to say, I don't hold, hold a hose, mate. It's a matter for the states. It's not a race on vaccination. The simple fact is the government has tried to undermine the states, including Western Australia. Here, at the same time, we're supposed to have had Indigenous people vaccinated much earlier. Instead, we now see outbreaks in remote communities in the Northern Territory. We have a gap uh, vaccination gap of something like 22 per cent. This is bad enough, but when you come to west of Australia and Queensland, the gap is over 30 per cent, with a national gap of some 28 per cent in vaccination rates. It was always well understood that remote communities are more vulnerable from the start, and from the start there should have been a plan for them to be vaccinated first, but the government failed to do this. 
it failed to prioritise people appropriately uh, in the vaccination rollout. Aged care workers were supposed to be vaccinated by Easter this year. Workers that are already struggling through a critical workforce shortage <clears throat> caused by this government's underfunding. They failed in that target too. Promise after promise to protect this country during this pandemic. We still see a drag on dedicated quarantine facilities in Australia. Hotel quarantine is not a sustainable solution as the Commonwealth pushes us to open up internationally. This is an outrageous dichotomy. Almost all of the leaks of COVID-19 into the general community have come from hotel quarantine. Leaks that have caused devastating lockdowns across the country. And this is something that the Commonwealth government has failed to take responsibility for. Hotels were not set up for quarantine. We've been calling on the government for the duration of this pandemic to take responsibility for quarantine again and again. And only now do we begin to see movement. But do we see this movement complete? Do we see it rolled out? Do we see federal quarantine supported facilities open and active before we open up the international borders? No. We've seen designated quarantine facilities behind schedule. Quarantine Services Australia is now only gearing up to provide quarantine for skilled workers and international students, where they will be charged nearly four times what state and federal governments have charged uh, for quarantine. This is outrageous. Trust this government to attempt to let their mates gouge profits out of students in a pandemic. Even worse, it turns out that this fee-for-service setup is being run by Scott Morrison, our Prime Minister's friends, who were the only people approached by Home Affairs to run the quarantine system. DPG Advisory, which is led by the Prime Minister's friends, uh, David Gazard and Scott Briggs, they had to advise on setting up the private sector quarantine service. Scott Briggs is indeed a former Liberal Party state director, party donor and friend of the Prime Minister. Mr Briggs is not just a pop in cash for the ra raffle at the local Lib fundraiser kind of uh, donor. He is at the heart of uh, the political circles of the Liberal Party and their power hub. He's the one whose company, a largely inactive political consultancy business that Mr Briggs started four years ago, uh, he's the one on whose company last year was reported to have donated $165,000 to the Liberal Party. When asked about it, Briggs and the Liberal Party denied the $165,000 donation and they declared to the Electoral Commission that it never happened. Mr Briggs also has another company, Pacific Blue Capital, who've made 14 donations to the Liberal Party worth $90,000 in 1819. This is the man who recently resigned from, the very, from very aggressively bidding for the $1 billion visa, visa privatisation contract the government has recently abandoned. Perhaps the Liberal Party and the government are trying to make it up for, to him. He is the only one whom Home Affairs has contacted to run this privatisation of quarantine. Quite a consolation prize, isn't it? This kind of job for mates approach is something that this government blatantly takes on. They blatantly deliver it. It is little wonder that the public is losing faith in our federal leaders by the day because of this kind of activity. Our nation needs answers, explanations and accountability. What this government needs to explain is to the, to the Australian people is why is it even necessary to create a fee-for-service quarantine system run by the private sector in the first place? The need for this has not been established, especially when QSA has said that it will charge clients up to $13,750 per person for these quarantine services. 
Why is our government attempting to monetise the pandemic when we as a country could have been domestically manufacturing the mRNA vaccines uh, much earlier than we look to? They've been proven to be the vaccines of the future and Australia has been behind and contributed to their research and development. We should have the cap capability to produce them. To produce them, to protect our health, but also secure jobs and economic prosperity. This should not be about trying to get a job for your old mates who've given your political party a lot of money. But no, we have a government that has taken too long to protect us from this pandemic. Too long to rule out misinformation. Too long to bring out information for Australians about the vaccine about our vaccines. Too long to get those vaccines into the country. Instead, they've held up their hands, not led. Instead, they've pandered to extremists attempting to get votes. Our nation needs a government that we can trust to respond in a crisis. Thank you. Thank you, Madam. Uh, Senator Pratt, uh, call Senator Van. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Well, here we are today, another MPU concocted out of thin air by the ALP that the Morrison government is undermining mental, uh, public health. We really should thank those opposite for these Dorothy Dixes that they deal up uh, every other day. On the, both the health and economic fronts, Australia has fared better than most countries dealing with COVID. I think it's fair to say, Mr Acting Deputy President, 38 developed OECD countries, Australia has the second lowest number of COVID cases per capita. By avoiding the death rates of OECD countries, Australia has saved over 30,000 lives. And while Australia has been doing it tough because of the, the longest lockdowns in the world, particularly in, in my home state of Victoria, Australia was also the first advanced economy to have more people in work prior to COVID than, than, uh, uh, than prior to COVID. Nearly 900,000 jobs have been created since May last year. After last year's recession, Australia's economy recovered to larger than prior to the pandemic, ahead of many advanced major economies in the world. On the, the point of vaccines, on November last year, 2021, the Prime Minister pointed out in an announcement that the government had ordered 135 million doses of vaccine, contrary to what those opposite have been saying. More than enough doses for, for five doses for every Australian. On 21st of February this year, the Prime Minister announced that the government had a comprehensive plan to offer COVID vaccines to all Australians by the end of October 2021. And I think it's safe to say that we've seen that. By the end of October, um, we hit 80 per cent vaccinated. No one said that the rollout of the vaccine had to be a straight line. Of course, it's going to ramp up. That's the way these things work. And with more than 92 per cent of the eligible population aged over 16 protected with the first dose, and more than 86 per cent of eligible population aged over 16 fully vaccinated with both doses, this government is clearly in a position that is delivering on its promises and delivering results and from our investments in our public health that has put Australia in one of the best positions in the world. Now, I'm awfully glad that uh, Senator Kitching mentioned mRNA in her urgency motion today, and I noted the contributions of senators opposite um, about how there is no vaccine, mRNA um, vaccine manufacturing in Australia. Well, just today, I you know, point to an ASX announcement, but I can also part, point to a media release from the Premier of, uh, of Victoria talking about how Australia, Monash University, where I currently study, uh, their Institute of Pharma Pharmaceutical Sciences and an Australian drug manufacturer, IDT, have produced the first mRNA vaccine in Australia. That's right, the first mRNA vaccine in Australia. So it's hard to imagine how those opposite missed all this, but it's very clear that here in Australia, we are progressing towards manufacturing of mRNA vaccines and other therapeutics and other vaccines, not just for COVID. And 
This is coming about because in my home state of Victoria, we have the strongest ecosystem for medical research and manufacturing in the country. Now, other countries such as Singapore have announced that they're going to be building their own facilities as well. And they have said that as soon as they can do it is 2023. Now, we have a long way to go. The vaccine that's being developed in Victoria to, uh, that I've just talked about um, is making quantities enough to be able to go into phase three trials. And as we recover from the COVID pandemic, we want to make sure that we're well placed to control our own destiny. And in a more uncertain wor world, this means that it is more important than ever to have that sovereign manufacturing capability. And we have that. We're building towards that. Uh, the, that mRNA vaccine candidate that I was talking about before, the Morrison government invested $3 million towards that. So we're very proud of our efforts in building that sovereign mRNA manufacturing capability, particularly in Victoria, in my home state. The mRNA capability, once we have that, that uh, capability, will create the potential of thousands of associated jobs and will be of great benefit to our economy. But constructing that sovereign capability is no easy task. Such a vital and critical undertaking is a complex task. And, and to operate those facilities and where to operate those facilities is a critical decision for the future. But Victoria has the ecosystem. We have the research scientists. We have the, the manufacturing um, capability, as those opposite would be aware. CSL and Victoria are already manufacturing the AstraZeneca um, vaccine. An mRNA manufacturing complex requires the best medical research ecosystem and support. It needs to be located in that ecosystem, which has the, that proven pharmaceutical research capability, and the workforce to be able to back it up with the skills in precision pharmaceutical manufacturing. The reality of the situation is that there are two important elements to developing an onshore mRNA capability. That is having the manufacturing capability and having the intellectual property and know-how. It takes time to be able to develop both of these things. The real benefit to Australia of this endeavour is to protect Australians' long-term health needs and to help grow and develop an mRNA ecosystem and industry here in Australia. Now, you don't just do this for COVID vaccine. MRNA technology is a, is a platform rather than just a vaccine. And work is already underway to create mRNA technology to address illnesses such as cancer, HIV, the Zika virus, Epstein-Barr, as well as autoimmune disorders, cellular engineering and protein replacement therapies. This is important for Australia. It's important for the future of manufacturing, an important part of building our sovereign capability. And that's why it's essential we get this right. And our thorough, measured approach is the right one to achieve this, Mr Acting Deputy President. Mr Acting Deputy President, the Australian Government is also on track to have purpose-built quarantine facilities delivered in the north, south, east and west of Australia to ensure we maintain a robust quarantine system to bring Australians home safely and so we have the capacity to respond to future emergencies. The government's priority is the safety and well-being of Australians and supporting those overseas to travel here safely. The government has already supported over 60,000 Australians to return, including 32,000 on 211 facilitated flights. We uh, invested $513 million to increase the cap capacity of Howard Springs uh, to 2,000 return travellers. The Centres for National Resilience under construction in Melbourne, uh, Brisbane and Perth are well underway. The return numbers have reduced. Um, sorry, the Centres for National Resilience will have an ongoing role as part of the government's national response to COVID-19. There is a need for purpose-built quarantine for people travelling to Australia from high-risk locations or who are unable to quarantine at home. And these centres will provide adaptable, enduring capability that will assist the Commonwealth now and in response to future health and emergency crises. The centres will be built and owned by the Commonwealth, but they will be operated by the state governments. The government is working quickly to ensure that, that the construction of the centres is completed as soon as possible. In Victoria, my home state, we expect construction of the first 250 beds will be completed by the end of this year. 
the next 250 by early next year, and the last 500 beds of the 1,000-bed facility completed in the first quarter of 2022. In Western Australia and Queensland, we are working towards the construction of the first 500 beds at each site being completed by the first quarter of 2022. This capacity is in addition to the existing capacity of up to 2,000 beds at Howard Springs. So I think you can see, Mr Acting Deputy President, that we are well and truly looking after the public health. We're looking after their well-being. We're looking after their jobs. We're protecting their lives and their livelihoods. And I thank the uh, senators opposite for this MPU to be able to put that on record. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Van. I now call Senator Roberts online. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. Can you hear me? Certainly can. Loud and clear. As a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia, I agree that the Morrison government did too little too late. Yet I find it damn hard to agree with Labor, whose premiers have damaged our economy and our jobs. The Morrison-Joyce government has had no plan, was slow to respond, and was slow at every point on the critical path. The government failed to learn lessons from other nations that were ahead of them, such as Taiwan, well ahead of them. Taiwan, where they protect the sick, the aged, the vulnerable, while keeping their economy and people's businesses and jobs going. The Morrison-Joyce government and state premiers have been busy on the political point scoring, not the doing. Queensland's Anastasia Palaszczuk is far more concerned about looking good and sounding good than doing good. Her border lockdowns and sacking of health workers has damaged families, businesses and jobs and regions. Under Labor, Queensland's economic future is now jeopardised. Had the Morrison-Joyce government allowed equal priority to other treatments such as antivirals, many more Australians would be treated and safe and the virus would be finished, as it is in other countries that are using this, the antivirals. Instead, the Morrison-Joyce government reliance on only one treatment is a major risk, a provisional COVID injection that the TGA did not test and could not and will not guarantee as safe. And that concerns a hell of a lot of Australians. Yet the Morrison-Joyce government and the states have chosen to punish nearly two in every 10 Australians for not taking this unacceptable injection and the risk associated. Understand us, Prime Minister, the Liberal Nationals and the Labor Greens are forcing a huge segment of the pub public into voting against you, calling honest, everyday Australians, quote, anti-vax extremists, end of quote, has never been the answer unless you and Labor believe that punishing and threatening workers with the sack is the right way. I don't. The name National Cabinet sounds grand, yet is nothing more than a meeting of the Prime Minister, State Premiers and Territory Chief Ministers trying to hide behind collective decision making instead of standing up and being accountable for decisions. National Cabinet is a pretend concept to protect politicians from what they are not doing and from protect them from their own mistakes, hide their mistakes. It's time to stop sacking workers and instead focus on jobs and the economy and on people's health and safety. Instead of looking good, let's have the people safe and healthy. One Nation will continue to stand up for all Australians, injected or not injected, for our jobs, our rights and freedoms, and to keep Australians safe. And I want to just remind people of what the people are saying. I want to remind senators of what the people are saying, because I attended a lively meeting at Redlands, which is in the southeast of Brisbane, a suburb, and also in uh, uh, Morton on Sunday night. Redlands was Friday night, Gold Coast on, on Friday morning, Gold Coast on Saturday, and then uh, Morton on, on Sunday night. The bankruptcies, a person who's built a business up, he's had to sell his house to pay off the assets in the business, and then his wife and daughter will not be able to work after the 17th because of Anastasia Palaszczuk's edict and, and medical apartheid. So what the hell does he do? And he's one of many, many, many people who are very angry, and rightly so. What about a, a veteran up at Morton? Physical injuries, cannot get physio anymore. A veteran served the country and now will slide backwards, she's worried about, 
physically and mentally. What about all the other veterans in the same position? This is what Scott Morrison and Anastasia Palaszczuk are doing thank to this you, country. Senator Roberts, your time has expired. Senator Sheldon. Yeah, thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. Well, it's been almost two years since COVID first hit Australia, and the government has failed to open up any new quarantine facilities. Mr Morrison said it isn't a race. Well, he certainly tried to prove that. We have another new COVID strain and no new federal quarantine facilities. Mr Morrison has been caught with his pants down yet again, but also he's pulled the pants down of the Australian public. Prolonged border closures will now have a cascading effect across Australian society and the Australian economy. One essential area that will be disrupted is aged care, an area which has a massive crisis at the moment due to its very low wages and very uh, poor working conditions. Just 6 per cent of residential aged care workers have a permanent full-time job, just 6 per cent. Shortages of labour across the, across the aged care system, a tight labour market for those um, providers, is causing undue havoc for our the most elderly and vulnerable people. And the government says job security is a made-up issue. Well, when you've got 6 per cent of the workforce full-time in aged care, then job security certainly is an issue. The other 94 per cent of casuals are casuals, precarious part-time subcontractors or labour hire. And now we've seen the exploitive gig platforms like Mabel replacing even part-time jobs, both in the aged care ser services but also the Na National Disability Insurance um, Scheme. And those undervalued workers, where they've got doing part-time jobs with full-time bills, are leaving the industry in droves due to the fact that the wages are so pitifully low. Now, why, why are aged care workers so poorly paid and secure? Well, some suggested it's because 86 per cent of them are undervalued and undervalued female workforce. This government sees aged care as being women's work, so why should they be getting paid a living wage? It is this government that has responsibility to make sure that we have aged care workers to protect and deliver for our aged care, our aged population. Quite clearly with aged care and how it's occurring and operating now, there's been a number of calls by industry providers, and I note the minister, um, to deal with the crisis for aged care workers. Rather than listening to the Royal Commission into aged care, where they stated very clearly that there was a need for increased increase support. You know, the Royal Commission said we both consider on page final report in volume two, page two one one, we both consider that Australia's aged care is understaffed and the workforce is underpaid and undertrained. Yet what steps have we seen from the government? Extending student visas where they can work in aged care by up to um, 40 hours. And of course, all that does is take a moment of some pressure, whilst evidence has been given time and time again about the number of shifts that aren't being covered because people can't be retained. You get paid more working at Woolies and Coles, and no reflection on those jobs are important jobs, as we've seen through the pandemic. But you get paid working in there on a cash register or stacking shelves more than you get paid looking after our elderly. And for those that don't appreciate all that, just imagine having a dementia patient that you have responsibility for. Now, I've spoken to many aged care workers over the last uh, 18 months, and just recently, only a matter of months ago, in Foster from three different facilities. And those workers said, we love our job, but we have people missing shifts, we have shifts that need to be filled, we have services that can't be provided, and quite frankly, the pay is so low it's horrific. And we're dealing with dementia patients that have everything from memory loss to violence. 
And that's the sort of system that we've seen broken down through this entire period of COVID. That's the system that we've seen highlighted during the COVID period. And that's a system that needs to be aggressively improved right across the system so that all Australians can have a better go in aged care. Senator McLaughlin. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Well, the Labor Senator's um, contribution to these debates remind me of a, a saying of a Jacobean playwright, of all the forms of wisdom, hindsight is by general consent the least merciful and the most unforgiving. This government has actually shown great foresight, great anticipation of the challenges the nation was going to face and has faced with COVID affecting its population. And as a result of its initiatives, it has now a proven record of dealing with COVID. And as a result, we've had one of the lowest fatality rates and highest vaccination rates and strongest economies in the world. That is success. The motion which we're debating this afternoon makes specific reference to the delivery of sovereign mRNA vaccine manufacturing capacity. And I would like to take, um, bring my comments to that in particular. Honourable members of the Senate should know that there are no new end-to-end -end mRNA facilities that have been established since the vaccines were approved anywhere in the world. A facility to be established in Singapore won't be on, online until 2023, at the earliest. And none of the submissions through an approach to the market by the government said they could provide an end-to-end -end facility in the near term. In essence, this motion is criticising the government for not achieving the impossible. The government is still taking action to bring mRNA vaccine production to Australia. The government is speaking extensively to Moderna, one of only two mRNA vaccine approved for anywhere, use anywhere in the world. There are other approaches to market. The reality of the situation is that there are two important elements in developing onshore capability. You have to have a manufacturing capability and as well as the intellectual property and know-how. In essence, this motion, as I have indicated to the chamber, is criticising the government for not achieving the impossible. The government is doing all it can to produce to achieve sovereign capability and, is, and where we are at the moment is competitive with most other nations in the world. The government is not able to send off Prometheus to, to magically produce manufacturing plants. Now, honourable members should be aware that more than 99 per cent of over 70s are protected with a first dose, and more than 97 per cent have received a second dose. Success. More than 97 per cent of those over 50 have pro are protected with a first dose, with more than 93 per cent have received a second dose. Success. More than 92 per cent of the eligible population aged over 16 and protected with the first dose. That's 92, around 90, just over 92 per cent and more than 86 per cent of the eligible population aged over 16 are fully vaccinated with both doses. Success. So I would encourage senators to take a more re realistic approach rather than the miserable uh, contributions to the Senate dragging down efforts of a government that has worked collaboratively with states, even those states which have uh, governments of a different political persuasion, to keep Australians safe. We must remind ourselves that we have one of the lowest death rates from COVID-19 anywhere in the world. This government has estimated, it can be estimated, this government has protected over 30,000 people from death if you compare it against our rates with the OECD average. The government is establishing a national plan to reopen. It's committed $33 billion to a vaccine rollout and strengthen our health system in response to the disease. Mention has been made by senators on my side of the aisle of Howard Springs as a quarantine facility and the investment in new centres in Brisbane, Melbourne and Perth. 
were beginning to establish overseas travel, although that has been paused as an, out of an abundance of caution. Australia has fared magnificently compared to other countries. It should be a cause of celebration in the Senate, not denigration. The question is that the motion be agreed to. Those that have the opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the noes have it. The ayes have it. Division required. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes. Stop the bells. The question is the urgency motion moved by Senator Kitchen be agreed to. Eyes will pass to the right of the chair, nose to the left. I appoint Senator McCarthy. Teller for the eyes. 
Senator Chandler, tell her for the nose. There being 20 ayes, 20 noes, the question is resolved in the negative. Just give senators a few moments to clear the chamber. Uh, we will be moving on to documents. 